call this meeting to order this evening the Lake Whatcom Cooperative Management Program Annual Joint Councils and Commission Meeting. <laughs> For Wednesday, uh, March 26th, 6.30 p.m. This evening we have Bellingham City Council, Whatcom County Council, and the Lake Whatcom Water and Sewer District represented with commissioners as well. Oh, wonderful. And first off, um, we're going to do roll call. And who's doing that? Do I do that? <laughs> no problem. Kathy Lehman? Here. Michael Lilliquist? Here. Here. Roxanne Murphy? Here. Jack Weiss? Here. Um, Jean Knudsen is uh, having an, an excused absence, and uh, we have Terry Borman, I don't believe is here. And is that everybody? Pinky Vargas. Pinky Vargas, sorry. And then County Council. Oh, I'm supposed to, uh, uh, do you, uh, you want to call to order, Carl, your own uh, council? That's the normal way you do it, but. You're up. <clears throat> Do you have to turn these on? I'll uh, call to order the county council portion of the meeting, and I can just announce that all council members are present with the exception of Sam Crawford, who just sent me his regrets. He's on his way to Olympia to attend a transportation improvement board meeting. I think it would be helpful. Okay, Listen. Barbara wants us to call the roll. So, right. so <laughs> present are uh, Rudd Brown, Barbara Brenner, Carl Weimer, Ken Mann, Barry Buchanan, and Pete Kremen. Okay. Thank you, Carl. And Lake Whatcom Water and Sewer District, Leslie? I would call the meeting to order for the Lake Whatcom Water and Sewer District if I had a quorum. However, I don't. Uh, we have three excused absences. That would be um, Commissioners uh, Wide, Citron, and Miller. Uh, I do have uh, two commissioners present, Deb Lambert and myself, Leslie McRoberts, uh, which means that when we come to the portion of the meeting where we are going to be voting on a resolution, we will take that back and we will vote on it at our own meeting um, in two weeks. Thank you, Leslie. <clears throat> okay, we're going to move quickly into our first item of the night, which are brief comments from the executive management team, Mayor Linville, County Executive Laos, and Lake Whatcom Water and Sewer District General Manager Patrick Sorensen. So if you'd like to potentially come forward to a microphone. We don't do a meeting like this every day, so thank you for bearing with us. We might as well sit here together, don't you think, Patrick? Welcome. So, now that we're all seated, um, welcome to the Bellingham City Council Chambers. Appreciate you visiting us today for your meeting. Um, it's a pleasure to sit in front of all of you because um, I know that I appreciate the um, cooperation and joint efforts of this body in trying to protect Lake Whatcom, our watershed that is the drinking water source for over 100,000 people, which is over half our county population. Um, it's an ecological um, treasure, it's a drinking water source, and it's recreational too. Um, so there's no way we can replace it. Um, the city of Bellingham, Whatcom County, and the Lake Whatcom Sewer and Water District have worked on three five-year plans. I wasn't around for the first two. I think they were good ones, um, but the next work plan that is going to be developed is for the 2015-2019 time frame. And I have a lot of um, hope that it's going to be something that uh, really results in a lot more results for the lake. Um, we have more knowledge, we have more experience, and we have more cooperation now than I think we ever have. And that's what's going to lead to our success, I believe. Um, we have had some measurable, measurable successes in Lake Whatcom. 
Um, we've reduced phosphor phosphorus, I know how to say that word, um, while protecting our watershed. Um, we have learned a lot about stormwater and stormwater discharges into Lake Whatcom, which are very important to, first of all, I believe prevent and then treat. And uh, we're looking a lot on the prevention side of that. And we also working closely with the residents in the Lake Whatcom watershed to see what they can do to prevent runoff from their properties into the lake. Um, we've done this together. I've enjoyed meeting uh, quarterly about with, uh, with Jack and with Patrick and staff um, to hash out what we should do next and to talk about um, how we can make our results better. And uh, I think that the, this policy group is the appropriate place to set direction uh, for the administrations to implement. So I'm glad you're having this meeting. Well, uh, it's good to be here this evening. I know I've met a lot of you. I've been here for about yeah. years. Yeah. You're not yeah. on, Patrick. Oh, I'm not on. Yeah. There we go. Is this better? I'm sorry about that. I get in trouble for that at work, too, occasionally. <laughs> But anyway, my name is Patrick Sorensen, and I'm the general manager of the Lake Whatcom Water and Sewer District. I've been blessed to be here in Bellingham for almost four years, and so I guess I'm going into, like the mayor, going into the second or the next edition for me. I want to say on behalf of the district and the board of commissioners that uh, the district is excited and happy to work with both the city and the county. We have invested, like the city and the county, but we've invested probably all a couple million dollars over the last few years in terms of our sewer treatment side, or not treatment, but our collection side of our operation. And the purpose of that is only to improve the, uh, our collection system and to reduce the possibility and threat of any overflows or contamination. So we think it's important because on the other side of the ledger, we also, like the city, utilize the lake for drinking water in regards to the communities that we serve outside in the county. We are committed to continue to work with you folks, everybody here. We will do whatever we need to do. I know we look forward to the discussion tonight. I know the board is committed to addressing these issues and serving as a partner in the ways that we can best do. And that includes stormwater issues too out in the unincorporated county because we know that impacts the lake as well. Um, my thanks obviously to these folks and their leadership and their staff in particular. They've done an excellent job. These are top flight people that I've had the opportunity to work with in the short time I've been here. Thank you. I'd also like to, uh... I'd also like to extend thanks uh, to uh, City of Bellingham for hosting uh, this meeting tonight uh, for the work that the Bellingham Council, the Wachtum Council, and the Board of the um, Lake Wachtum Water and Sewer District are doing for uh, improvements uh, to Lake Wachtum. I think we also need to uh, thank tonight the uh, Watershed Advisory Board and of course all of the staff members from these organizations that are working day in and day out to improve uh, our environment. So uh, a round of, a, round of thanks and applause to, to you guys for the work that you're doing. You know, we've accomplished uh, quite a bit of work in the watershed uh, in the last years, and I think we're at a point right now that we're bending the curve um, to get more done, in large part because of the support that we're getting and the cooperation we're getting between the organizations. If you take a look at uh, what, we've, what we've done and what we're doing to make a difference, if you take a look at the city's right-of-way improvements on North Shore, the county's work in the Coronado and Fremont Street area for, for improvements in Geneva. The joint project that we're undertaking uh, near Academy to treat the uh, runoff that's coming off of that hillside. Uh, we've expanded the homeowner's retrofit program to include both city and county residents. And I think that that uh, is something that we, can, uh, that we can make some great inroads on uh, primary treatment. Of course, land preservation is a big part of what we're doing also, and I think for most, for most of us, I would say that the highlight last year is the Whatcom County Council voting to uh, reconvey the 8,800 acres uh, of property uh, back to Whatcom County. If you look at this map, and it's going to be coming up on the charts, and I'm sorry I don't have it turned both ways, but the, the green is areas that uh, we have under our control and protected. The 
Purple areas already are areas that we've done uh, retrofitting on, and the blue areas are the areas that we're planning on doing between now and the end of 2018 with our current plans. That means we have thousands of acres of land protected. Um, we've, we've retrofitted uh, about 1,090 acres of developed land, and we're going to add another 530 acres to that in the next, uh, in the next few years. So I see that as major, major uh, accomplishments. And I think that the next five years, as I say, we're bending the curve to get more, to even more done. I see that the next big push that we need to work on is to work with, with Patrick, the Water and Sewer District, and the residents of Sudden Valley so that we can uh, do uh, as much secondary treatment in that area as possible. I think that we're going to gain the most bang for our buck if we continue to work on improving that densely populated rural area. And I'm appreciative of the Water and Sewer District, their, their commitment to this. Now we have a member of the, uh, uh, the Sudden Valley Community Association that's sitting in with our meetings and we're, uh, we're going to continue with the cooperative effort to see what we can do there. So anyway, there's a lot of competition for the water resources uh, that are available, but I'd encourage all of us to stay focused on our immediate priorities. We have a plan, it's making an impact, and uh, I encourage us to stay on track because any delays that we have uh, at this particular time just means more phosphorus in the lake. And uh, again, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Thanks for all of your work. Thanks for the community being, in, in, being interested in this. Uh, we have a, a natural treasure out there and we need to do everything that we can uh, to protect it uh, for the health of our current citizens and our, and our future kids and grandkids. So turn the meeting back over to you. Thank you all very much for being here and for your great comments tonight. Um, we're going to move next into our first Thank presentation you. of the evening, which is uh, our 2013 Lake Walk and Work Plan accomplishments and major 2014 activities. And <clears throat> John, am I turning it over to you? Oh, yes, we are. I figured is this it out. The presentation we're going to be looking at? Yes. Thank you. Got it? Do I have it here? Let's Just see. Start from the slide. First slide. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay, let's make sure I know how to operate this. Okay. Oh, the power. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> I'm going to be yeah, asking. Well, good afternoon, and uh, on behalf of the staff, uh, the 20 or so staff that uh, meet regularly to work on uh, the Lake Watkin Management Program to do all this coordinating, uh, thank you very much for inviting us back again. You know, I was, uh, I was talking to Kirk Christensen uh, this morning, uh, who's one of my compadres over at the county, and we were, uh, we were noticing how every February comes around, the uh, Lake Whatcom, the staff meetings for the Lake Whatcom Management Program get this sort of anxious um, sort of cloud that starts <laughs> to build up on the horizon as we look forward to doing all of this work uh, to, develop, <laughs> to develop the materials and uh, get uh, a good look at our programs to uh, present to you all and to the community. And as we were chatting about that, uh, it struck me that that process is also a bit of a catharsis for us in us having to take, bring our little piece of the puzzle to the table and lay it out so that all of our peers can look at it, hold it up against the big picture, and, uh, and really take a good hard look at the value of our contribution uh, to this program overall. It, it's sort of like a, a force team building exercise, if you will. Uh, but I do honestly believe that that process is good for us as, uh, as a staff, uh, as the staff. And uh, I guess with that, I appreciate very much uh, that we have to do it every year. So with that said, let me, uh, let me jump right into the uh, the main event which is the uh, the annual program review and as in last uh, several years we're going to focus uh, mainly on the phosphorus reduction uh, work that gets done by the uh, by the the uh, Lake Watkin management program and 
like every year, we try and uh, try and start the conversation with with a goal in mind. And uh, this evening's goal is uh, for you all and for the community at large to to walk out of the uh, conversation with a better understanding and perhaps uh, more ownership of the Lake Watkin Management Program's five-year planning process. Something that was started back in the early 90s and uh, has been in place ever since. We work off these five-year plans. And as uh, the mayor and the executive were pointing out, and Patrick were pointing out earlier, uh, this is really a, a, a transitional point in time. We've done a lot of work, spent about 15 years uh, understanding how to deliver these services. And I think that as we go into the next five-year plan, we can do so uh, increase, with increased confidence in those outcomes for future phosphorus reductions. And that's our goal this evening, is to try and uh, make that happen. And uh, I'm going to have to push the button or I'm going to be rolling back and forth here on the mouse. Okay, I think I've got this figured out. So, uh, for clarity and uh, so you know where this conversation going is going to go, I'd like to just offer up the messages that we intend to deliver uh, right up front, and that is that the, uh, the Lake Watkin Management Program reaches much farther than uh, those requirements uh, uh, mandated on us by the Clean Water Act. Uh, it was something that began as, uh, as a community vision, that is the program itself, uh, for sort of a holistic look at how to manage the lake. And that's certainly something that's beyond uh, just regulation. That said, of course, we remain very much phosphorus focused, focused on the prevention side of the house and the reduction side of the house. Um, it's important to recognize that uh, we are, in fact, ahead of the TMDL schedule. Uh, the TMDL itself has not been formalized. Um, we shouldn't make too much of that because we all recognize th that, uh, that it's not perhaps as aggressive as it could be and that collectively we agree that more should be done um, uh, to keep us ahead of that, uh, of that curve. Uh, it is the last year of the current five-year plan. A new plan must be developed and given that we already know what's likely to come down in terms of that regulatory uh, framework, we need to make that plan consistent with the TMDL requirements. Uh, and finally, um, I think Executive Laos pointed out that, uh, that we don't want to lose sight that we do have docketed already a substantial amount of work for the upcoming uh, several years, and we don't want to lose sight of delivering those phosphorus reduction projects and programs as we debate what we're going to do for the future, because the reality is a pound of phosphorus reduced today is worth a lot more than a pound of phosphorus removed from the system 10 years down the road. So, all right. Uh, it's worth taking a moment. I would have liked this meeting to be perhaps on the shoreline at Bloedel or perhaps in the airplane that took the picture so we could all get the big, the big view here, but this is all I could pack into the, into the chambers. Um, but it does, uh, it does help characterize the system in which we're working, and that is, first of all, that it's darn big. The lake itself is 10 miles long. It uh, spans a mile wide at its widest part, and the, the picture before you is really only of the upper third, the northernmost third of the lake. And uh, in as much as it's 10 miles long, a mile wide, and 30 miles around the outside, it, it's uh, quite something to, to try and manage because of that, and uh, it has a long history as well. So 150 years is a working lake in which, uh, in which sediments uh, in which forest practices and, uh, and other uh, uses of the landscape weren't up to, uh, up to today's uh, standards, resulted in a lot of uh, sediments, nutrient-containing sediments, and, and other pollutants entering the lake. Uh, we will likely refer to the various basins in the lake as basins one, two, and three, and it's worth reviewing what that means. Uh, basin one is the northernmost basin that is closest to us in this picture. Uh, it is largely developed uh, with uh, fairly high density, mostly in the city and the UGA. Uh, basin two is the uh, small basin that's uh, behind basin one. That's the basin from which the city takes its water. And uh, 
is also uh, specifically or mostly on the uh, west side uh, in Geneva is fairly well developed. And Basin 3 is that great big deep basin uh, to the south. And uh, most of the water quality problems of, of, uh, uh, of immediate concern uh, t in terms of drinking water, of course, are Basins 1 and 2. Um, uh, but we have a TMDL for the entire lake and of course we have real concerns and a vision for a clean entire lake. Um, so what about the management program itself? Um, it's been around for about 20 years. I, I think first contemplated in around 1990 as the uh, city was, uh, was putting forward its first stormwater ordinance. And by 1992, there was a joint agreement about the management of Lake Whatcom between the city, the county, and then Sewer District 10. Uh, now Lake Whatcom Water and Sewer District, and that agreement laid out a, a whole host of goals and objectives for, uh, for collaborative management. And some work was done uh, in the ensuing years, and by 1998, it was recognized that there needed to be some funding uh, directed toward this collaborative work and some more clarity about how it was going to be carried out. And that's uh, the interlocal agreement that's referred to there in 1998, and that is really the precursor to the Lake Watkin Management Program that called for regular planning and uh, resulted in a couple of one-year plans before in 2000 the first five-year plan was penned and, uh, and agreed. So over the course of time in the 2000s, uh, a lot of stuff was done uh, towards management of the lake as a whole. Uh, particularly around uh, nutrient loading. The city's Silver Beach Ordinance in 01, the Lake Whatcom uh, Development Standards in the county in 02, restrictive covenants uh, removed quite a number of lots, uh, a questionable development sites in Sudden Valley. Uh, that was a collaborative effort between uh, Sudden Val the, the uh, Sudden Valley Community Association and, and the uh, county and uh, down zones removed another 1,400 or so uh, development opportunities from the watershed. Uh, transfer of development rights program removed another hundred. Then the city's acquisition program came into being and uh, and that rolled forward as well. The clearing restrictions, the fertilizer bans, the two-stroke motor bans. Remember that? Yes. <laughs> um, in any case. Uh, we, get, we get up to about 2009, the, uh, the regulations uh, at Silver Beach are updated and uh, move towards a more, uh, more aggressive uh, set of development regulations that, that uh, denies the development if it can't demonstrate that there will be no net impact to the, uh, to the lake. Um, and then in two thir 2013, the county followed with similar uh, protections. And, during that time, of course, more and more uh, effort in public systems, more and more investment in public systems uh, in and around uh, the developed portion of the lake. That's the history. The scope is pretty straightforward. Um, the, back in 1998 when this was developed, it was, the idea was that there would be some holistic and, uh, and systems approach to managing the, the uh, lake itself. Uh, and it all kind of backed this uh, community vision of a healthy watershed and protected uh, drinking water source uh, far into the future. And I've uh, showed on this particular slide just uh, a couple or several of the uh, 12, now 13, with the inclusion of the invasive species portion of the program, uh, of those now 13 program areas. Uh, that we work on, and you notice that they're not all directed uh, specifically at phosphorus reductions. Spill response, for example, uh, has as much to do with car accidents out on the uh, out on the North Shore Road and understanding what to do when, or uh, or other practices that result in chemical spills and the like, so that we are coordinated and know what to do with that. And uh, so, all of that said. Why are we concerned about phosphorus? Uh, it's pretty straightforward, but it's worth, uh, it's, it's worth saying that excess phosphorus accelerates algae growth. Those algae are consumed by bacteria which use up oxygen in the lake. And it's that low oxygen condition uh, that releases more phosphorus from the sediments 
that over the 150 years as a working lake have, uh, have accumulated in the bottom. And that condition we know as an anoxia creates a feedback loop that leads to more phosphorus and a cycle of, uh, of accelerated or extreme biological productivity. And you see that happen in your backyard ponds as, uh, as the summer wears on, the algae grow, it becomes opaque, it smells, and it's just generally grody to be around. Uh, we don't generally suffer that kind of situation in Lake Whatcom, but nonetheless, there's a measurable problem and those problems that we experience are, have to do with water treatment problems, not specifically the, uh, the clogging of the filters in a year after a great storm event that flushes a lot of, of uh, nutrients into the lake, but rather the day-to-day -day water, uh, water treatment activities that happen out at our water treatment plant. And then, of course, there's the aesthetics. It is a multiple-use lake. People like to come in contact with that water and should be able to do so. Low oxygen, of course, is bad for fish, and uh, we don't want it in our bay. We don't want these, these big uh, anoxic uh, zones in our bay, neither do we want them in Lake Watcom. And uh, finally, just to uh, bring the point home about where that phosphorus begins, uh, the graph shown there uh, shows on the purple circle dotted line a uh, particular rainstorm that occurred in the Silver Beach area in September of 07, and the red squares are the total phosphorus loads in the lower portion of the creek uh, during that same rain event, and it's pretty evident from the, from the correlation between those curves that there's clearly a relationship between the rain event itself falling in the watershed, picking up the phosphorus-laden sediments delivering them to the creek and moving them down the creek. Uh, so that connection isn't, uh, isn't lost on too many people though these days and uh, leads us uh, to a question about the sources of excess phosphorus. Most of you have seen this slide before, so I won't go into it in detail, but there are a host of causes uh, for which uh, just about all of them today, this program uh, has a mechanism to address. Uh, and, and mechanism to improve uh, the situation as it exists out on the ground. That's true with all of those sources, with the exception of atmospheric deposition and, of course, the remaining material and the nutrients that exist in the lake sediments. And the point here is that there are certainly some sources of phosphorus uh, that aren't in our control. Um, and if you're if anybody's wondering what uh, excess phosphorus can look like, here's a couple of examples uh, of, uh, of soil-laden water uh, going down a storm drain, uh, being delivered directly perhaps to a creek, a, uh, a lawn that uh, as beautiful it is, as it is, we know that it doesn't, uh, doesn't cycle phosphorus like a native forest would. And uh, in the worst condition in the world, you might imagine an algal bloom looking something like that. Uh, but please don't think that that is our lake, because it's not. Um, so at this point, that's sort of the backgrounding. And what I think we have planned for you is Kathy. Oh, there she is. I thought she had run out or something. But uh, uh, to talk a little bit about the uh, 2013 program and uh, some of the highlights of the work you'll see in 2014. Thanks, John. Um, so yes, I'm going to go over some of the highlights and some of the accomplishments uh, of 2013. Um, inside your uh, reports, there's a lot more detail there. And if you have any specific questions, maybe wait till the end and the proper staff person can answer that. Um, and I'll go into a little bit of um, some things that will be coming up for the 2014 work plan. So in 2013, we really continued with the land preservation efforts, um, and the city acquired 29 acres through the land acquisition program. <coughs> and that's the map up there of the Trillium uh, watershed parcel, um, pretty strategic in that it's uh, connected to other parcels that have been protected through that program. Um, as well as what was mentioned earlier, the eight, over 8,000 acres uh, through the reconveyance um, for Whatcom County to manage in the future. So really for 2014 and beyond. 
Um, I think the jurisdictions are going to be looking towards how to increase management um, of a, a lot more property out there in the watershed. Oh, sorry. Uh, we have a couple capital projects that were completed in 2013. One of them was in the Geneva neighborhood, uh, Coronado, Fremont, treating about 170 acres. Sudden Valley also completed, it says two projects proposed. They were proposed and completed in 2013 as part of their capital facilities plan. Um, in addition, we had the homeowner incentive program, which is in its third year of the grant, and the city completed 41 projects just in 2013 alone for that. And moving into 2014, the city of Bellingham and Whatcom County have finalized a interlocal agreement that will allow the county to implement the homeowner incentive program in the county's portion of the Silver Beach Creek watershed. Um, and we have, uh, between the two jurisdictions, there's about 40 projects that are queued up uh, for that program this summer. Um, and as you can see, there's a few projects happening with uh, each of the jurisdictions in the North Shore area, uh, continuing to another phase of Coronado Fremont, as well as um, some work being done down in Sudden Valley. And the city of Lake Bellingham and uh, Whatcom County are doing a joint project this next year um, at Academy Road, which is going to be a combination of uh, filtration and infiltration filtration methods, uh, treating about 80 acres, uh, coming off the water, coming off the hillside of Academy Road. But that's a little shot of it right there. Whatcom County this last year finalized its uh, finalized um, some regulations for stormwater uh, that would be put on restrictions for phosphorus uh, inputs resulting from development, um, more in line with the Silver Beach Creek updated ordinance. Uh, so that went into effect this last fall. Um, the city of Bellingham has been working on uh, streamlining their Silver Beach ordinance process, and in the future, uh, we'll be taking uh, the results of what the what's happening with that development and using uh, that information to fine tune and make changes and updates in the future um, if needed uh, to accommodate the TMDL. There were quite a few events this last year uh, that the city and the county um, and other um, entities that we coordinate with, uh, that we participated in. Um, there's, if you went through your report, there's quite a few numbers there. Um, there was a lot of different audience that we targeted from homeowners uh, to landscapers and different contractors, people that are in the industry of, uh, of uh, doing work uh, that uh, affects the watershed. Um, and these topics that we covered are anything from water conservation to homeowner practice practices to water quality in general. Uh, actually, one thing, sorry, I wanted to note about uh, the community outreach is most recently, two weeks ago, we had a homeowner and set in a program one day <coughs> workshop uh, where we, we basically had a, um, a hands-on planning um, workshop where homeowners could come in and actually work with site site design and work with landscapers and learn about the different techniques that they may be able to deploy through the homeowner incentive program and that was quite successful. It was a one day event. We had about 80 participants at that, at that workshop. Um, and with data management, uh, the data management program is sort of this kind of behind the scenes program. It's, it's ongoing. Um, it consists of coordination between the entities and the uh, jurisdictions and agencies that do, uh, do water quality work. And we're, what we really do is uh, share the information of the contracts and the monitoring that we have. Um, how this is important is that it really is going to be informing um, what's happening in our tributaries. Uh, what's happening within the lake. Um, it's informing our lake, lake Whatcom Annual Water Quality Report produced by the Institute for Watershed Studies. We use this information to, to quantify the effectiveness of our stormwater facilities. Um, and also, it's going to be, uh, this data is going to be used to update the models that we're going to be looking at through the TMDL throughout the next few years. And that's really the highlights from uh, 2013 and what's coming in 2014. And I think at this point, I'm going to hand it back over to John, and he's going to kind of take you through what our next steps are. Thanks. Thank you, Kathy. Very good. So um, 
you know, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, it's really this uh, this question of how we add up the uh, the sum of all of the work that we're doing individually and asking ourselves what that means in the big picture uh, that this meeting is all about and uh, and how that conversation plays out over the course of the next uh, the next year or so and so what I'd like to do is turn now away from looking just at 2013 from that one year, that sort of uh, individual year look, and sum up the, uh, the total benefit that this program has, uh, has delivered in the way of these uh, capital projects, in the way of reductions, in the way of uh, protection for the watershed, uh, and what we're doing uh, in administratively as well. So where we are today in sum, over the last 15 years perhaps uh, in the way of reducing the existing footprint of our uh, existence in and around the watershed is 20 plus major capital projects that have been that have resulted in uh, measurable decreases in the amount of phosphorus that enters the lake every year uh, as you just heard, this first generation of residential in incentive programs uh, that were piloted, I think, four years ago that was started, have resulted in, uh, in 84 properties retrofitted. We've learned a ton about how to do that and uh, some more comments on that coming up, but uh, expect that to be uh, those benefits to continue into the future. Uh, redevelopment standards watershed wide, something that perhaps some folks thought might never happen uh, a number of years ago, uh, but in fact, we have done so. We have a modicum of uh, redevelopment standard around the entire watershed. The city and the county work very closely together uh, in reviewing development applications and uh, in en enforcement. Uh, I think that's quite important. And when you sum all that up, there's an estimated uh, 312 12 or so pounds per year of phosphorus that has been removed. Um, and you might ask, out of how many? And I'll get to that shortly. Council Member Lulliquist. So for, in terms of pre prevention, um, about 1,800 acres of develop, developable, developable property has been, uh, has been removed from uh, from development, about 164 acres of donated properties in addition to that, and if you add in the reconveyance, uh, there are approximately 11,000 acres, 10,800 give or take a few, that are being managed with phosphorus reduction or phosphorus uh, prevention measures at the very top of the priority list, which is something very different than those properties, uh, how those properties existed prior to, uh, to their protection. And I think that's the point. Uh, Watershed-wide development regulations that meet the protective ecology standards are also important because they say something about how development will carry forward those lots that are still yet to be developed, how that will affect the watershed. And the bottom line is, by the ecology standard, it should have very little or no impact to uh, nutrient loading uh, in the lake. In terms of administration, uh, of course, the, the uh, question about the original data set uh, on which the phosphorus loading model was based has uh, driven uh, us collectively with the Department of Ecology and others to, uh, to really want to know more about the allocation of, the, of uh, phosphorus problems in the watershed so that we can better direct our resources towards those. And so we've been working on, uh, on uh, improving that uh, phosphorus loading model, results anticipated soon. Um, expanded data collection in support of that. Uh, obviously learned a ton about how to, how to reduce phosphorus and most importantly the cost of doing that. And uh, I think that's something that uh, as we get into a conversation with the policy group uh, in the upcoming weeks uh, that we'll, we'll really focus on. Uh, our improved education programming. Um, I can remember uh, the, about the time that I first got here uh, one of the uh, education and outreach staff handed me this enormous package that uh, we were sending out to all the, the 
watershed residents that had all kinds of really good information about what you could do to reduce phosphorus loading in the watershed. Unfortunately, it was very, in the uh, manner that it was delivered, it was very general in nature, and I can imagine that not too many folks took the time to read through one pamphlet after another. Uh, we're, we've uh, developed some strategic marketing approaches that are real focused in nature, whether they're focused on, uh, on the pet waste problem that, that, that uh, exists in the more developed, you know, all kinds of things, but we've got some strategic marketing approaches that, uh, that are going to change things. So, uh, and then the plans for a new lake response model. Um, this is something, these model updates are something required of the TMDL, so we want to get started sooner rather than later. Uh, the mayor and the executive both noted that, uh, you know, that we are on a current trajectory and we have been uh, for quite some time. In other words, we've been doing the work and delivering the project projects and making reductions in the watershed uh, that I noted added up to somewhere on the order of 312 pounds per year. Um, on our current trajectory, given our capital plans as they exist today, we envision that we'll be removing an additional 450, or excuse me, treating or managing stormwater on an additional 450 acres in the uh, developed portion of the watershed, that is in the UGAs and in the city, uh, perhaps a little bit on the outside of the UGAs. And we'll be doing that with the public systems. Those are, those are projects that are already programmed. Uh, and that brings the total to a little over 1,500 acres uh, treated. Uh, that also adds up to about another 116 pounds of additional phosphorus removed uh, from the creeks and streams that enter the, water uh, the lake every year, bringing that total reduction to something on the order of 428 pounds per year. Uh, those numbers are fairly conservative because they don't contemplate the likes of the second generation of residential incentive incentives that uh, Kathy Craver talked about. Uh, they don't con contemplate uh, what benefit the, our collective work in Sudden Valley might offer us. They don't contemplate, because we don't know what those are yet, uh, they don't contemplate a renewed focus on things like uh, waterfront buffers and stream buffers and those sorts of things. So what does that look like uh, on the ground in terms of our footprint? And uh, this is actually the same slide uh, that you see in poster form uh, to my right. Uh, but the bottom line is that there's a substantial portion of the watershed that is now under the influence of the governments and somehow uh, managed in a way in which phosphorus is one of the highest, if not the highest, phosphorus reduction and protection, highest, if not the highest uh, purpose for which that property is, uh, is currently managed. Um, so we're looking at, uh, well, you can see the acres up there. There's no sense in me uh, reading them again. Uh, bottom line is we have made good progress. So now let's do the numbers. Um, the proposed, this proposed uh, development and investment in, uh, in public water systems in, and, and others by 2018 will look something like this. And you probably remember these pie charts from last year in which the pink and the red represent how much the TMDL as it exists today says we need to remove from, in this case, basins one and two. The, two green, the dark green color is the loading from existing forested area. That stays. And the 225 pounds in the light green area uh, is the amount that is allowed to be generated by our developed uh, landscape. So when you sum all of that up, 428 pounds divided by 428 plus 757, you get to 36 pounds phosphorus removed. Did I do okay, council member? <laughs> it's a little inside joke here. He's, he's good at asking penetrating questions. So bottom line, 36% removed. And the reason this is important is you'll remember that last year when we talked about this, at the end of 2012, we were at about 23% removed. This year, we're somewhere around 26 percent. 
from these increases, you can get a sense that we can indeed predict, predict out um, to some degree with some level of some planning level of accuracy, uh, what kind of progress we can make in, uh, in delivering these water quality services. Now somebody is clearly going to ask, well, what about the whole watershed? And the reality is that uh, when you sum the whole watershed together, uh, we are today at a, or will be, if we keep the same trajectory, uh, by 2018 at about 14 percent of uh, the phosphorus, pounds of phosphorus per year uh, that we need to remove. So bottom line is we have a lot of work to do um, and we know we can make good progress. All right, so how does that square with this whole TMDL Clean Water Act regulatory time, timeline that uh, we know is is waiting out there for us in the bushes. Uh, the reality is that the, uh, the, the status today is that it remains awaiting EPA approval and in fact is still undergoing uh, ecology's internal review uh, of, of what we're calling the implementation plan. So while we know that it's likely we'll hear back from, uh, from ecology and it'll be submitted to EPA sometime in the next months. Um, who knows when it comes back from EPA? And I don't have a very good sense about what that, uh, what that review time looks like. And what it means simply to us is that, that the uh, actual years in which we are held accountable for some of these things could change. But we do know what that draft implementation plan proposes today and what it's likely to, uh, to burden us with going forward. And and it's set up in a several cycles, the first of which begins in 2015 through 2018, in which the city and the county, uh, as the responsible jurisdictions, uh, need to provide ecology with options for how they're going to meet the TMDL. That is, what is the plan for the kinds of actions your, you, the local governments are going to take to make those reductions going forward. And they suggest a fixed timeline, that is, what is it going to take you to get it done in 50 years? And then if you want to offer up a fixed budget kind of approach, what will it take, how long will it take you to get that done? And I suspect that needs to be less than 50 years. By 2016, we've got to have timelines and budgets put together. 2017, uh, provide a detailed plan that has milestones going out 10 years. And by 2018, we've got to come back to ecology with this whole concept of improving uh, the models on which this whole analysis is based. Um, there are a couple of other cycles, and I won't uh, dwell on them because they're really about doing the work. So how does that square with what we've got, wh what we're doing here locally? Um, and some of this is, a, the, the first number is a little bit unfair because uh, a group of uh, folks in the community back in 1992 had a vision that they wanted to uh, protect their drinking water source and initiated this whole process starting phosphorus reductions in earnest uh, in 2002 as compared to what the, the TMDL offers up uh, as a 2014 date. That comparison's a little unfair, but the rest of them uh, you can see for yourself. So providing the timeline and budget, the TMDL calls for 2016 and we're saying, look, we need to start that this year. We're on track to start our next five-year plan. Let's make that the vehicle for doing this work. Uh, the same thing with adopting the timelines and budgets. Uh, we want to be ahead of that. And my, my personal vision is that we'll be back here one year from now celebrating the fact that your respective councils adopted a plan for the next five years so we all know what our job is. So we'll see how that goes between now and then. But uh, providing the 10-year milestone, something the TMDL calls for in 2017, uh, I think the staff, uh, Lake Watkin Management Program would submit that's something we ought to do uh, over the course of the next year. Same thing with remodeling the watershed. Uh, the lake model itself is a fair bit more complicated and, uh, and is out there a bit further in time. Uh, complete the TMDL. Well, 50 years from 2014 is 2064. Uh, TBD in this case means to be determined. 
meaning that the conversation begins with the policy group, uh, with the councils, and, uh, and us providing you the information you need to, uh, uh, to make those determinations. So uh, just a couple of quick thoughts on how this work planning might lay out so that everybody gets a sense of what we're thinking anyway um, and can weigh in on that. Generally, the TMDL aligns with the five-year work plans, and, and given that there may be a year or two uh, of incongruity and uncertainty, uh, we've got a current plan that ends this year, future plan that if we stick to the uh, program that was developed back in 2000, we ought to be updating this year. And given the fact that we know what's likely to be in that TMDL regulatory document, we ought to make a yeoman's effort to get that uh, as part of this next five-year plan, which means having more certainty of where the goalpost is and how we're going to get there and reasonable conversations about uh, what investments will be necessary. Um, and of course, the open public process is, uh, is very important because in the end, we've got to have community buy-off on, on this effort. Without it, it doesn't work. The policy group uh, has a, a schedule that it has contemplated, and I've tried to summarize this in a way that, uh, that doesn't tie you to any particular meetings, but rather gets the gist of what you've already said you're going to talk about. Um, the first meeting being coming up in the next couple of weeks, uh, in which the policy group intends to contemplate the costs of phosphorus, phosphorus reductions. That is, what does our experience today tell us about how much these investment co investments cost? What is their cost benefit? And if we are to put together a package at a very high level planning kind of look, what does that cost us to get to those uh, reduction numbers uh, that we're being asked to achieve? That conversation will be pretty interesting because I don't think that it's something we've done really in earnest in the past, uh, something that uh, Council Member Weimer and others have, uh, have been asking for. Uh, that will set us up to have a conversation about our current capacity, and that is not so much how many staff members we have and how much money we have, but more about the trajectory that we're on currently and what sort of delivery you get for that, and how does that compare to what your vision of the needs are, and then we get, um, it, the conversation continues to get more interesting, doesn't it? We get to talk about money uh, and what your thoughts are for the, the needs in terms of uh, the TMDL, that is that whole idea of a fixed timeline, we're going to do it in 50 years and here's about how much it's going to cost, or we're going to do something different than that. So that's sort of uh, setting up the conversation and the idea is that out of those uh, discussions will come a framework by which the staff can come back and develop a plan that is consistent with your expectations and uh, then ultimately move those discussions about money to, uh, to the right place, and that is on your, uh, on your desks. And then uh, as we get into the fourth quarter, uh, expect to uh, begin formal public review. In other words, we have a, a draft document that uh, uh, that we can begin a co community conversation around uh, and on from there. That's kind of the vision at this point, and uh, I think it's something that is doable. I think it's something that uh, is consistent with uh, what I take to be your purpose and your interests as you've put forward in these resolutions uh, that you'll contemplate here uh, in a few minutes. So, final thoughts. Um, the take-home message is that uh, this Lake Whatcom Management Program is, in, in my view, something more than just a response to a regulatory mandate. It's about a vision that the community has for a healthy lake, for clean drinking water that's protected into the future. Uh, that said, we remain focused on prevention and reduction of phosphorus because it is one of the most, if not the most, problematic uh, and difficult to manage uh, problems that the watershed faces. Um, we're ahead of schedule in terms of uh, our regulatory requirements, uh, but we recognize that those uh, leave something to be desired perhaps and that uh, we agree, collectively agree, we should be more ahead of schedule. 
Uh, the next five-year planning process needs to be consistent with those TMDL requirements I just reviewed, and uh, we can expect or should expect that the aggressive work that is currently planned will continue as these discussions go forward and we capture all of that in the next five-year work plan. So that is the, the sum of, I think, I should look at all the staff members who helped me put this together and ask them, did I hit the main points, guys, or do I need to start over at the beginning? <laughs> Enough? <laughs> the boss says get the heck off of there, so okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, will you take questions if we have any? Absolutely. Great. Any questions or If they're comments? nice. Yes, Barbara. Um, one of the, I, when you talked about, you had that uh, chart that showed the different, uh, one of them was fish and forest. Yes. How, why didn't it say fish, forest, and habitat? Because in our other thing, it does say <laughs> habitat. And habit, you know, that's kind of a big one. It was that really nice yeah. one. So th those, uh, I won't go back to it, but the point is that uh, that was a selection of all of those 12 interconnected program areas that the uh, Lake Walken Management Program is, uh, is asked to work on. And uh, one of the other program areas has to do with, uh, there's a recreation, and I can't remember, is there strictly a habitat? There's supposed to be a habitat I should plan, know this from, but it uh, hasn't happened. Yeah, there's several other uh, that go with that. Yeah, it's in the plan. It's so, in the plan? I'll answer that question uh, as soon as I go read that okay. and get up to speed. Well, no, but even in the plan, it was pretty vague. Yeah. So. Good. That is a good question. Yes, Ken. Um, Dr. Hutchings, I, you had a great uh, graph that showed the correlation between rainfall and the phosphorus loading in Silver Beach. And I think we cr completed a pretty significant project in that area. How would that hydrograph look today uh, if we were to rerun it? Do we have any, do we have enough data yet on how it's working? Uh, I think the answer is that we do. Um, I don't know if that particular section of creek has been remodeled since, uh, since all of those uh, treatment facilities and uh, all the work was done with the community above. Uh, so the answer is that uh, I am absolutely certain that the total phosphorus concentrations that followed the storm event uh, are attenuated. Uh, I can't tell you how much. Substantially, how about that? Do, do you have a, a, an answer to that question that's a little more forthcoming than mine? Yes, I mean the... the um, Can I introduce yourself, the, Bill? The, the work on, I think it's on. Are you on? Why don't you say your name and title? So. Oh. I'm Bill Riley. I'm the stormwater manager for the city of Bellingham, Public Works Department. And um, yeah, uh, the, we, did, we have done the modeling pre, prior to those uh, improvements being put in. Uh, they're actually waiting for a, a couple more years for the, for the uh, projects to be um, better seeded. Uh, uh, it takes a little while for, for a, a large project like that to have its, its best uh, conclusion to it. So th there is planned sampling that's going to be happening on there, There's, it, it, but we haven't correlated that data to come up with a percentage removal for Silver Beach at this point in time. <coughs> Um, is somebody going to speak to, uh, more, in more detail, what the retrofits have been on the individual properties? I can do that. Uh, at this juncture, there have been, are you, are you talking about spe the specific actions that property owners have taken or the sum total? Well, just like what they are and um, what kind of retrofits. So homeowner retrofits have taken uh, uh, Is the microphone a little closer, Bill? I'll turn it on. Okay. <laughs> I thought I was supposed to be really sensitive, so I was afraid that I was going to blast people out. Don't worry about that. Okay. Um, again, Bill Riley, uh, City of Bellingham. Um, the, the homeowner retrofits, it, it probably is more a uh, question more for our, 
our specialist, Eli Makowitz, but I'll try to do my best. Um, there are, there are a, a wide range of uh, activities that have occurred on, on properties, and we compensate people based on how much of their property they actually are treating for phosphorus. It's, so it's a sliding scale. People get uh, more money for the higher percentage of phosphorus treatment they have on a site. Um, and and, it, and that, that can be from somebody having an infiltration system that takes all of the water and infiltrates it into the ground, which provides the best treatment to people doing lawn removal projects that, that changes the, uh, the way the, and the amount of phosphorus that's coming off the property uh, to try to emulate a, a forest or a forest light as we, as we call in, in, uh, in this design. So um, there are a, a, a lot of other different ways that people have done it. You know, something more like a traditional rain garden, but we've, you know, we've even done uh, specific standards for Lake Whatcom for rain garden construction so that, so that we can be uh, better assured that, that they're working properly and will be reducing phosphorus and not exacerbating phosphorus. <clears throat> Does that answer your question? Somewhat. Okay, I'm going to ask a question. Um, John, you had these slides um, with the, the pretty pie charts and the reductions <coughs> happening. Um, just looking at the comparison from the 312 pounds a year to the 428, I can fantasize that five years we might have all the phosphorus reduced based on, you know, my own look at this chart, but I'm uh, cognizant of the fact that we probably do the easy stuff first or the response begins to shift and we have new learning and new investments to do. So can you say maybe a little bit about yeah. what the future might look like in terms of our, our learning and our response? Yeah, I think that uh, it's um, there are a couple of ways to look at this. If you, if you go back and, and do a little thinking about what these numbers say, it looks like we're making progress at about 3% a year or something like that. And, uh, and I, hopefully I don't get too uh, constrained by that number because what I'm looking at are the, uh, the values uh, back in the end of 2012 compared to where we expect we're going to be in 2018. And in fact, if you look at the difference between 2012 and 2013, you also come to about a 3% a year number. Uh, so uh, given the fact that, in, and that's, that's uh, for basins one and two, of course, where we are uh, investing heavily in, in public systems as well as backing those public systems with, uh, with homeowner retrofits on the individual lots so that we can make those uh, substantial reductions. Uh, other places in the watershed aren't that easy to, uh, uh, to accommodate and, and others are easier. For example, um, when, we, uh, when we take a look or contemplate the idea of applying the same kinds of incentive programs out in the county that we, out in the rural part of the county, for example, that we use in denser urban areas, um, we may find or perhaps we're likely to find that the same prescription that works in the city of Bellingham doesn't work so well elsewhere and that we'll have to rethink uh, first of all, the prescriptions we're offering up and then uh, if we're using incentives, the, the kinds of incentives that work. Uh, we may also find that, uh, that, or I think we are finding that in terms of, uh, of phosphorus prevention, uh, that is the acquisition program, uh, uh, moving those development, future development rights, uh, taking those development rights out of the watershed and holding on to that property for the purpose of not allowing future phosphorus uh, to enter the lake. That we're running out of high density properties to purchase. And I don't mean running out as in tomorrow or next year or the year after, but over time, the bang for the buck for that investment 
gets smaller and smaller. And so then we have to ask ourselves whether that's still the most appropriate place down the road uh, to focus those dollars. Um, but the bottom line is I think we can say something about a trajectory that we're on today. It seems to look something like, say, 2 to 4 percent a year, and you can begin to contemplate what it takes to get you, how many years it takes to get you down to, uh, uh, well, let's do the math right here. So in basins one and two, we're about 36 percent over the course of, say, the last uh, 10 years, and so if you're to, uh, if you're to multiply that period with the, over the same investment by three, you get 30 years out. So it seems, uh, and then if you make, uh, you make some concessions for the reality that it is harder and harder to squeeze more and more phosphorus out of that landscape, uh, you, could, you could easily see it might take 50 years uh, to get that done. So we've got some more work to do to you know, sit down and talk all of that through, but I'm convinced we've got enough information on which we can base some pretty sound decisions about what we ought to invest in over the next five years, uh, perhaps with a, with a pretty strong look 10 years out, but just like doing capital facilities planning, you know, once you get out four years into the future, the costs of those investments and uh, the benefit of those investments are pretty uncertain. Um, but we can certainly do better than we have in the past. Thank you. Interestingly, I forgot to mention, and none of you have asked yet, so I'm just going to say it out loud. Uh, the, the cost of the overall program uh, is somewhere on the order of about uh, $7 million a year. That is when you add up all of the expenditures that were made over the course of 2013. Now I'll couch that by saying that that number is sure, and it does, vary widely depending on the kinds of acquisition, acquisitions are made, uh, and well, mostly acquisitions and capital, uh, capital investments. Uh, but it does give you a sense of just how big, uh, how much investment is already being made in uh, the Lake Watkin watershed. Thank you, John. Yeah, Rudd. So I'm sure there's, I'm sorry, Rudd Brown, Watkin County Council. I'm sure there's some people that would be interested if you could just briefly explain what happens to the phosphorus based on the different techniques you use. Do you, do you remove it from off site? Does it get Bound, bound with the soil, if it gets bound with the soil, does it reach a saturation point, for example? So, okay, those are good questions. You've been, uh, been paying attention to this problem from some time uh, by the looks of it. So uh, there are a number of different, uh, different approaches. Some of those are more mechanistic in which uh, phosphorus particles are filtered out and those uh, those filters are removed and uh, new ones replaced, and then uh, the phosphorus that's collected removed from the watershed. Uh, there are other approaches in which uh, the, the bioinfiltration facility is designed to, uh, because of its amended soil type and uh, the vegetation that has been selected for that facility, uh, draws phosphorus out of the uh, water that infiltrates through that soil. And those are also managed, so uh, there's somebody pays attention to, to the level of saturation that, uh, that goes on in those facilities, and then periodically, uh, as they become past a threshold of efficiency, uh, they can be changed out as well. They can be rehabilitated, if you will. And then there are other uh, approaches in which, uh, in which stormwater is simply infiltrated into the ground, in which the soil is, becomes the, uh, uh, the medium uh, that the phosphorus sticks to. And uh, in those particular cases, um, it's a question of the phosphorus cycling in that soil, uh, in, the, in the biological environment of the soil, and being immobilized so that it's not easily read readily available for for leaching. And in those cases, um, it is possible, I suppose, no, I don't suppose, I suspect it's possible to reach some kind of saturation point. Uh, the key is keeping the soil stable so that it doesn't re-enter the system and become problematic. Uh, so there is a complicated uh, biological uh, system in which uh, phosphorus is mobilized and, and immobilized in the soil environment, and when it's immobilized, it isn't readily leached, and nor is it readily plant available. So, uh, 
Yeah. Thank you. Michael. I guess the way I would uh, answer your, your question, Rudd, is that the phosphorus we're talking about is natural in origin. It's already there and in the soils and the plants, and they're not saturated. There's no such thing as saturation in a natural system. It's using the phosphorus. Our goal is to keep the phosphorus in that natural system, which can use all that phosphorus over and over and over again. It doesn't run out. It doesn't go away. It's just reused. Our goal is to have it stay in the upland natural system rather than enter the aquatic natural system. So that's our problem. The, the phosphorus is not evil when it stays upland. It's, it's reused and it never gets saturated. It never, there's never too much. There's never too little. It's where it should be. Any other questions for staff or each other, Barbara? All right, I, I'm going to try. I am going to try and keep it down. First of all, I do have some questions. Lots of them. Who do I send them to? I think if you either send them to me or any other staff person that you happen to know personally. <laughs> you can. <laughs> okay, and, but I do. Kirk. I have to put it out because I do it every. You know, are are you guys? Are we at all looking at oxygenators at all? No. <laughs> Any other questions or comments before moving on? Yeah, Pete. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, because no one said anything. I, I want to compliment you and, and the rest of the team for a very informative presentation. And I think it's indicative of the fact that, uh, you know, the three entities are, are working on all cylinders. And I think we're making great strides. We, can, we need to continue to, uh, you know, push forward. But uh, I, I'm very impressed with the presentation this evening, and uh, I'm really encouraged and excited about the, the plan and the apparent conviction and determination to, to really persevere and attain these laudable goals. Thank you. Just yes, me. thank you. <laughs> and uh, yep, you had something to do with this, too. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, that's a nice segue if <laughs> nobody wants to stop me. Okay. Um, we're going to move into uh, the next item, which is, thank you, John, yes. discussion and possible votes on joint resolutions. Uh, and I'll just note before we start that, that the sooner we accomplish that, the sooner we can move into public comment. And we have quite a few folks here tonight, so it would probably be nice if we can do that as quickly as possible. But um, I guess I'll introduce this, but I'd welcome comments from anyone else. Um, I think this idea came about um, about four months ago through a number of different discussions uh, with the folks at the Lake Whatcom Policy Group and staff. And uh, then we had some elections and some new council members came on both county council and city council. and. Uh, so this idea started t getting some legs, I think, of um, introducing a, a joint resolution between our three jurisdictions that reaffirmed our commitment to what we're trying to accomplish in the lake uh, and our efforts cleaning or, or reducing phosphorus loading, um, set some clear direction uh, for the joint Lake Walken Policy Group as they're moving forward in the next five-year plan and in the TMD TMDL response. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, this is the one that kind of surprised me the most, I guess, because I felt like it was so clear, but providing strong, clear policy direction from all of us um, jointly. And I guess I thought that was clear um, in myself. And when I talked to so many others of you over the years, uh, that there is a very strong commitment to this work. but. Um, I guess I'll just say I don't think it can be overstated, our commitment to accomplishing this and doing it together and taking the steps that we need to to make that happen as quickly as possible. And it is going to be probably a challenging period in the next uh, year as we write the next five-year plan and as we respond to the TMDL in the coming three to five years or more quickly if we can, um, making decisions about money, which is never easy, especially for groups working together like ourselves. So uh, I could 
We each have a slightly different version in our packet. Um, and so I could read uh, the intro statement and maybe the, the point at the end. But how do you folks want to do this? Any preference, Carl? Or Leslie, also, I know you don't have a quorum tonight, so. Um, well, I, uh, I'm assuming that all of them are identical. They're simply are on our own uh, formats right. for our groups. And um, I would just have, I'm, have, has everyone read this already for your own organizations? Okay. Then if there's a discussion to happen, um, looking at the first resolution uh, where we uh, <coughs> decide how we're going to move forward over the next three years mm -hmm. to have that discussion. And the, the two groups who are here present go ahead and vote on it and then we will bring it up. Assuming that it is passed in the same format that we have it here, okay. we'll just bring it to the uh, water district at the next meeting. Okay. Does that sound okay to you, Carl? That's fine. Barbara? Um, it w the packet that I downloaded at the office about a week ago that I've been reading, it didn't. <gasps> Sorry, it didn't have this in it. So I actually haven't seen it before, I don't think, unless it's something. You talked about it. We've talked about oh, okay. it at a couple of council meetings. All right, okay. if that's the same one. Well, um, well I'll, um, just for the benefit of everyone here, I think I'll uh, read the intro statement <coughs> and then the, um, the bullets at the end, kind of the, the nugget out of all of the flowery language. Um, this, there are two actions here, actually. One is um, about setting some specific goals for the policy group and some time frames around that. And then the second one is about inviting uh, Sudden Valley Community Association to participate officially with our jurisdictions on the Lake Whatcom Policy Group. So this is a joint resolution of Bellingham City Council, Whatcom County Council, and Lake Whatcom Water and Sewer District Commissioners reaffirming our shared commitment to the health of Lake Whatcom, setting milestones for 2014 through 2016 to improve its water quality, and setting goals for the work plan of the Lake Whatcom Policy Group. And now, therefore, be it resolved, uh, this is our city version, of course, so by the city council and the city of Bellingham. In cooperation with their respective administrations, the council's commissions of the Lake Whatcom Management Program established the following milestones for actions necessary to complete and implement a TMDL implementation plan, implementation plan and direct the Lake Whatcom Policy Group to initiate and oversee the accomplishments of these milestones. So there are three things here, uh, each with their own year. So 2014, that we establish policy principles for all areas of investment and identify expenditures needed to achieve load reduction goals in each area. 2015, we analyze expenditure levels, identify funding sources, and set specific timetables for each area of investment. And 2016, complete an implementation plan for phosphorus reduction and control of fecal coliform that will meet the requirements of the TMDL, protect our drinking water, and restore lake and tributary water quality. So essentially, the, what this does is um, put the onus on us to speed up our joint response together and, and uh, declare our commitment for a bit of a more aggressive action and uh, point, pointing out exactly how the policy group will contribute to our efforts in that work. So uh, any discussion? <laughs> Michael, I'm going to call on Michael, I guess. I would uh, like to speak in favor of passing uh, this resolution. I, one of the key points of the presentation um, was bullet point three for the messages and also for the final points. It, it says that the city and the county are ahead of schedule and that uh, we agree we should more so. I think that's less a statement about the rate of our progress uh, than about the slowness of the schedule. Uh, the TMDL process is long and involved and too long. It's longer than our community needs, longer than they, the lake needs. Um, for several years on the city council, we've been talking about uh, the implementation plan. After the TMDL, there will be an implementation, implementation plan. That was discussed four years ago when I started on the council and it was always felt like that would be real soon. The TMDL would go forward, we'd be in implementation phase, 
we're still not there. That implementation plan apparently is over on the desk of someone in ecology. I'm not sure exactly with EPA, I think, maybe. Um, also, uh, going back uh, several years, uh, Barry Buchanan will remember this. He was one of the people who was advocating strongly for a full restoration plan. Not the next five years of progress, but a, but a, a plan that actually, as best as it could, projected out to a final end solution. What we have before us tonight is a picture of progress, not a picture of success. What I'm seeing both from staff now and in this resolution is a desire for us to accelerate our efforts to, to honor exactly what the TMDO wants to achieve, but to do so on a time scale, an accelerated time scale uh, that I think is both um, uh, necessary and uh, doable. So I will be supporting this resolution. Barry, you had your hand up. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the County Council, I would like to move approval of this uh, resolution. Has to deal with it first. I guess so. Barry just, he's running with the ball. All right. Thank you, Barry. <laughs> All right. So we have a motion in front of us from the County Council. Is there any other discussion from the County? I guess I will jump in and, and as Michael did, I will support this also. I was somewhat skeptical of this resolution to begin with because when I used to sit out in the audience as an activist, I heard for 20 years people standing up here and giving us their commitments to Lake Whatcom and then I didn't see a lot happening. And oftentimes what you get is lots of hype and very little substance. I don't think that's what's going on this time. As you've seen in the last couple years, we've done quite a bit. The people that are, are moving this resolution forward seem fairly committed to pushing this process faster than the Department of Ecology wants us to even. Um, so, so I support this resolution. I think people ought to know though and probably shouldn't vote in favor of this because the handwriting on the wall is the policy work group is going to come forward with stuff that probably is going to involve raising taxes, raising fees, or putting more onerous regulations on existing development. And if you're not in favor of doing those things as we move through this, we've been criticized by our two other counterparts up here for not having a dedicated funding source for Lake Whatcom. So if you're not interested in entertaining those things, you should not vote in favor of this resolution this evening. But I'm in favor of it. Ms. Brenner. I'm in favor of it, but I don't agree with you on how to get there. Well, I think we need to normal. prioritize. <laughs> and we just, every time something comes up, we say, oh, let's get more money, let's get more money. I think it's, I think we could do a much better job of prioritizing, and this is a high priority. Anybody else from the county side? All right, we have the motion in front of us. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously with Mr. Crawford absent. Excellent, thank you, Jack. On behalf of the bill, yeah, it's on. On behalf of the Bellingham City Council, I move approval of the resolution. I'd like to second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second to in favor of this resolution. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed. Say that again. Motion passes five zero with two council members absent. Okay, and the, the lake. As a note, uh, we have discussed this in our uh, commissioner's meetings and we have uh, had a favorable uh, opinion of it and I expect it to pass also in two weeks. Great, thank you very much, Leslie. There is um, a second resolution. Um, I'll just briefly read. A joint resolution of Bellingham City Council, Whatcom County Council, and Lake Whatcom Water and Sewer District Commissioners inviting the Sudden Valley Community Association to send a representative to participate in the Lake Whatcom Policy Group. And I'll entertain a motion from the Bellingham City Council. So moved. Second. second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes 5-0 with two council members absent. Excuse me, can I get uh, who made the motion and who seconded? I didn't quite catch that. Was it? Jack moved, Roxanne Jack. seconded. <laughs> Roxanne seconded. Roxanne. Okay, okay, thank you. All right, we have the same motion, uh, we have the same resolution in front of us for the Whatcom County Council. And I, I will support that. The uh, Sudden Valley Neighborhood Asso Community Association has been attending the policy work group meetings for a couple years and has been a great partner in this and it only makes sense for them to be at the table. So is there a motion? I move approval, <coughs> Mr. Chair. 
All right, Mr. Kremen has made a motion. We have it in front of us. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes six to zero with Mr. Crawford absent. Yay, I'm so happy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, congratulations, everybody. Uh, that, uh, with that, we're done with the business of the meeting, and we're going to move into public comment, uh, public comment period. And uh, we did pick up a little bit of time, so that's great. Um, and do we? We have a list here. Okay, great. Thank you. I have four people signed up to speak this evening. If you're not signed up, and you would also like to speak okay of course um, come on down and form a line pr behind that map probably against the wall and we'll ask that you come up to the microphone and introduce yourself and give your comments for our benefit and I don't think we have a I don't think I'm going to mention that I don't, time no, it's not even plugged <laughs> okay. in okay sorry <laughs> So uh, first up is Greg Brown, followed by Paul Taylor and Brooks Anderson. Greg saying no. Oh, Greg saying no? Yep. Okay. Greg says no. Uh, Paul Taylor, Brooks Anderson, and Wendy Harris. Can you Paul Taylor? 3066 North Shore Road. About a mile and a half past. Can't hear. Is that microphone on? Bright light. All right. That better? Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'll start over. I, <laughs> I live at 3066 North Shore Road, which is about a mile and a half past the Fork Restaurant. I want to thank all you folks for all the efforts you're making to uh, promote lake health. Uh, one of the things I wanted to bring up this evening is kind of small potatoes compared to what you've been discussing, but I do believe it's important to the future health of the lake, and that's that within our neighborhood, there's been the appearance of about four vacation rental by owner homes <clears throat> last summer. And these homes are essentially uh, unregulated hotels in the watershed. They, um, and I don't believe what uh, the impact that they have on the lake promotes lake health. They, they provide more trips into the watershed. These homes advertise that they can sleep more people than their septic systems allow for. Where I live, all the homes are three-bedroom septic systems. All these VRBO advertisements say they'll sleep 10, up to 10. Some, not all of them, but many do. They're, one of them was full all last summer, almost every weekend for, I don't know, three, three and a half months. <clears throat> they also advertise kind of a resort experience. They advertise to bring your boat, bring your jet ski, bring your kayak, bring your canoe. One of the homes in my neighborhood has a private boat launch. We watched people launch boats there all last summer. I don't believe that uh, all of them were driving over to Bloedel, getting their boat inspected, and then bringing it back to, uh, to be launched at this house. The odd thing that I find is I'm in the building business, and I know that if I walked into the Office of Planning and Development out in the county, I, uh, I couldn't get a permit to build one of these things and operate one. And so it doesn't seem to me that if you can't get a permit for one, they should be allowed to exist. It, um, my neighbors and I did a little bit of research. We determined that there's about 14 of them on the lake right now. But I'm wondering, since no one's really keeping track of them, I mean, is next year there could be 20. Two years from now, there could be 30. Uh, um, at what point do they become an impact? Uh, I'm not sure. I think they're an impact right now. I know they're an impact in my neighborhood. <clears throat> in my opinion, allowing these hotels to operate in the watershed is, uh, does nothing to promote length, lake health and all the things that you folks have been discussing this evening. And I think they're detrimental to lake health. And I would urge that you uh, put on your agenda and an investigation into somehow figuring out a way to, to uh, eliminate these from the, from the watershed. I think that would be an effort or a continuing effort of all that you folks are making to uh, bring the lake back, lake back to the state it should be in. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Paul. Brooks Anderson, followed by Wendy Harris. Good evening, and thank you once again for doing this work. Um, it's pretty impressive to see you all show up knowing the workloads that you have. So again, I want to express my gratitude for all of you for doing your work. 
I'm um, here because I really notice in the resolution, and I know it's a huge, huge job, but uh, I see the word quality a lot in this resolution, and I didn't hear that addressed so much in the presentations. Um, a couple weeks ago, there was an article in the Herald saying that uh, we're going to have a pretreatment plant, which was the first <laughs> I had heard about it, but I understood from the article that there's already been thousands of dollars allocated to be spent for this. And part of the article said this is going to deal with the toxins that are detrimental to our health before they get to the treatment plant. My concern is that we need more quality in our lake, not so much quantity. And this idea about, and certainly you can't do this without money, obviously, but it seems to me that the focus, particularly of the person who I really have never seen before, John, who did the major presentation, um, I appreciate, but it's not so just about money. What is it about the education and about the people, all of us? And again, you know, when we went, th we've gone through several things before, it's the people. It's the people who make the difference. So I would really like to see you move more aggressively on the the quality and the people that are involved in this and less treatment to have it be clean water, but more resource of looking at what makes quality water. And my second uh, concern about this is I, I can't, well, I guess I can tell you, I've gone to probably a dozen meetings about water in the last month, not just about Lake Whatcom, but everything. <laughs> I mean, the, the League of Women Voters, the county's water action plan, uh, resources stormwater plan, um, you know, and one of the suggestions at, uh, that one of the panel members gave, and I know several of you were there, who said, we need, what's our next step? What do we need? We need the public to clamor. So I love that word, clamor, and I'm clamoring. I'm going to be after you all the time about doing what needs to be done, about quality. When I first moved here, and I haven't been here for five generations like some of my friends have, but I've been here 10 years. And when I first moved here, I was just stunned to see all of the recreational use, the planes, the boats, the dogs that were on my drinking water source. Where I've lived before, it's always been, if it's your drinking water, it's fenced off. You don't do that. Now, I know that's a huge, huge thing to even suggest, but there was a woman who's n who died not, not too long ago, but when I first moved here, she was running for mayor of Bellingham. Sharon Costner? Kosher, thank you. And she, that's what she was, that was her platform. She was running about not having that kind of activity on our drinking water. And I know that that would just be, talk about trouble and about raising money. That would really be a big, big thing to take on. But you know what, guys? As much as I really appreciate you and think you're doing a great job, take it on. I'm clamoring. Thanks, Brooks. Wendy Harris. Um, Wendy Harris. I live one block from the lake. The latest Lake Whatcom monitoring report by Dr. Matthews, which I, I found it interesting we didn't discuss tonight, indicates that we currently have the highest recorded levels of carcinogenic byproducts in our treated drinking water. Isn't that really the true test of how we're doing? I believe we're actually regressing in our efforts to restore the lake. When I first started working on lake issues, it was commonly understood that we needed to address watershed growth, increased impervious surfaces, loss of forest cover, and on-site infiltration, and that regulation was an important tool for achieving success. Today, we no longer talk about regulations or watershed growth. We talk about incentives and engineered stormwater approaches, which transfer costs from developers to the public. 
We believe we can engineer our way to clean water. We ignore the science regarding comprehensive watershed-based approaches and the importance of treating watersheds as holistic ecosystems. Clean water is the byproduct of a healthy lake. I now believe that one of the most harmful things we did was allow fully engineered stormwater approaches um, for new and redeveloped property. Under this approach, we eliminated or reduced limits on impervious surface and vegetation removal. And the vegetation that we allowed didn't function as a fully forested uh, uh, forest. It didn't have, you know, the, the forest cover and then the, the middle shrubbery and the undergrowth. It, it's just sort of a plant layer and, and it's, it's not complete and it's not functionally equivalent. The result is that downhill property owners are now dealing with ever greater amounts of stormwater runoff, which is my case, um, where I'm dealing with um, water sheeting down the alleyway behind my home despite some extensive retrofits. Although I have no control over the infill development that increases the stormwater runoff and I have no property interest in the alley, I'm being told by the city that I'm responsible for managing alleyway stormwater impacts. I've been put in a situation where I'm unable to keep increasing amounts of city stormwater off my property and as I mentioned, I'm one block from the lake. I do not consider this progress. I would like to see the data comparing the performances of the fully engineered stormwater approach versus the fully forested stormwater approach. I know that we've had, um, the city standards have been in place since 2009, so please show us the data. We have not been using the authority provided to local government, which places the costs and burdens on land developers rather than the public. For example, we routinely issue SEPA determinations of non-significance for shoreline development, despite the science that these activities degrade water quality, and we, we require either no mitigation or inadequate mitigation for impacts. We approve shoreline permit exemptions, conditional use permits, and the increasingly popular variants, all of which allow expanded uses, reduced buffers, and greater amounts of impervious surface. If you don't believe me, please take a, uh, a drive around the lake and look at the new property that's been going in. At a minimum, we need to adopt a policy for no net increase in overwater coverage at Lake Wadcombe. In fact, a better policy would be to outright prohibit new and expanded docks, covered moorage, sea jet, jet ski lifts, and boat houses. Overwater structures are extremely harmful to the aquatic ecosystem. We have a lake that's already impaired for low oxygen levels and is now under attack by invasive plants and animals. Our Asian clam infestation is connected to recreational water use and shoreline modification. Instead of restricting these activities, we actually encourage them. In fact, if you go through the, the um, pamphlet we got on um, accomplishments for 2003, um, recreation, watershed recreation is listed in there as, as one of the accomplishments. We've instituted a publicly funded boat inspection program, which itself has negative impacts due to the need for expanded parking and roads at a waterfront park. Um, the city is going to be asking for a variance after it already got a conditional use permit to allow a competitive row team to put in a boathouse. Um, and while we're busy inspecting these boats, seaplanes are flying in and out of the watershed and landing on their own docks, subject only to self-inspection self under the honor system. This undermines the entire boat inspection program. We really need to consider no boats, no recreational use of the lake, um, and severe restrictions on shoreline development. We need to regulate, monitor, and enforce provisions for reduced impervious footprint, increased vegetation, um, particularly 
true forest cover the way it occurs in nature, larger buffers, and on-site infiltration through LID techniques, which is going to be required soon anyhow through um, the state's updated stormwater standards. We need a funded water improvement plan that has timelines and quantifiable water quality goals. I know we keep saying we're ahead of schedule on the TMDL, that TMDL draft that talked about the two plans that we need came out more than a year ago. So I, I, that's not that speedy to me. I'd like us to move faster. Up until now, all of our five-year plans have been unfunded wish lists without guidelines for performance or, or timelines. There's a lot of work to do. The good, the good part is that the science is there. We know what to do. Now we need to find the political will to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. <laughs> Folks, please refrain from responding to comments. Next, we're going to have Marion Bedell and then Gathia and Kate. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Marion Bedell, south side of Bellingham been working on this issue for about 20 years. Uh, I hark back, there was, oh, first let me say uh, congratulations to the staff for the presentation that was done today. It was very easy to read, easy to understand, very attractive, and so forth. Looked kind of like a sales pitch to me. Uh, no, be proper. Uh, Back in 1992, the councils that preceded you, all three of them, prepared a set of 21 goals that they perceived at that time, this is 91, 92, needed to be uh, accomplished in order to properly protect the lake. That probably is still available on some of the government websites. I brought it into my preferred favorite website, lakewatcom.org where right on the front page is a link to look at those 21 goals that were stated and the resolution that supported them. My question to you and to a degree to the public is go look at that list of 21 goals and see how all of them stand and fare today in regards to what we need on the lake. Some of them have been pretty well taken care of and others are still dangling out there waiting for action. One of those, many of you know, was, as was mentioned tonight, very proudly, the land acquisition that, had been, that has been done over the last 15 or so years of purchasing properties in the Lake Watkin watershed and holding them in perpetual forestry for the protection of the lake rather than development. That's a program of the city of Bellingham. Why did the city start that program? Well, two reasons. Number one, it was, I think, goal number two on that list that was mentioned six or eight years before. Nothing had been done. A group of citizens, of which I'm proud I was a part, came together, looked at it, wrote a citizen initiative, put it on the ballot for public vote that said, institute this program that you already said four years ago you were going to do. Well, unfortunately, it narrowly failed at the, at the polls. But part of the conversation about that, which I won't bother to, to try to explain or to repeat, led the city a year later to say, you know, we ought to start this land acquisition program. Here's a resolution and, and a process to collect money to buy the land. So yes, thank you, congratulations. I, I pat myself and my friends a little bit on the back for having pushed that issue. Uh, that's a citizen process works, and I encourage the continued participation of citizens to push you, the councils, who are our representatives on these things. Finally, a technical point. And permit me to state a little bit of my history and background as relates to this. I am a civil engineer. I worked in water management systems for many, many years. I ran a public works department for two years. I ran a factory manufacturing water movement equipment for a couple of years. So I've been around, and I've seen some stuff on this. My point that that's the background for is the treatment facilities which are being used now, and some perhaps that are not yet, were mentioned in the presentation. 
the uh, homeowner improvement program, the rain gardens, where you put the water in the phosphorus in the soil, what I call the concrete box with a, with a filter that, uh, that captures the flow, and then you take the filter out and throw it away somewhere. There's a middle ground style on that that, that does a, a, a different level of infiltration of the water and phosphorus into the soil as a method of keeping it from going down into the lake. My question has always been, and I'm sorry that I haven't gotten a solid good answer, is what is the capital cost of all of these systems expanded for the entire watershed area that we're concerned about? And how much phosphorus, what's the efficiency that these systems remove? I'm no expert, I acknowledge, in the operational efficiency of these systems from my personal experience, but I've done a lot of web research and reading technical materials from other jurisdictions nationally. And I have some notable doubts still that even the HIP program of the rain gardens is going to, in the long run, 40, 50, 60 years, hold and protect enough phosphorus from moving down into the lake. So it's a good sounding program now. It's certainly making an advantage, but whether it's going to be sufficient for the long run, I'm not sure. And the other part of that I mentioned is the, this construction of what I call civil works. Build a concrete box there on the roadside, put in some stuff like, uh, like a diaper to catch the, uh, did I say that? Uh, <coughs> to, <coughs> to catch the flow that goes through, grab the phosphorus, take it away, let sort of clean water run out the back end. In my review, and I seek a, a more solid technical number that contradicts me, I'd love to see it. My experience and, and search says those systems can do at very best removal of half of the phosphorus that's flowing in. The other half of it still gets through the filter and so forth. Plus the complicating moment that really bothers me, when there's a big rainstorm, they don't even run the water through, or more than just a little bit of the water, through that treatment system. It goes around and from the upland where it captures the phosphorus into the lake, straight shot in the gullies. So that's not a very efficient or effective process. So I ask both the councils, the staff, and the public to pay particular attention to how well and how effectively and at what costs are these treatment facilities being put into place. Uh, so I guess that's the points I'd like to make. Emphasizing again my pleasure at the work that has been done, yes. And the presentation that, uh, that was given tonight, I think, makes much of this that has been fuzzy in the past clearer to the public, and that's great. And in the end, I again ask the public to continue to tell you what they see, what they don't see, what they like, what they don't like, and let's get the lake cleaned up because it's our drinking water and we must. Thank you. Thank you, Marion. I just want to note we have 11 minutes on our schedule, and so if we can try and respect the time of everyone here tonight, it would be wonderful. So we have a couple more folks. If anyone does want to speak, please do come down and form a line here so we can get through you all. And go ahead, Gathia. Hi, uh, my name is Gathia Weiss, and I live in Bellingham. Uh, and I just basically wanted to make a brief mention that I, uh, Wendy Harris actually also mentioned the name of Dr. Robin Matthews at Western Washington University. Um, my feeling is just sort of the huge body of science uh, that does exist around the studies of Lake Whatcom are sort of been missing from this discussion tonight, and I would like to see those more actively included. Um, Marion just mentioned some civil engineering type difficulties with uh, different sorts of stormwater solutions. I think different solutions are going to be needed for different portions of the lake. Uh, it was mentioned by one of the people giving a presentation about amending soil before doing uh, rain gardens type structure. If you look at some of the geological studies, the soils up by Lake Whatcom are 
pretty thin. A lot of times if you put things into the groundwater, it's not like putting it in if it were Iowa cornfield. Uh, so the bacteriological and microbial activity that might break down phosphorus and use it and send it back to plant roots isn't there. And so it, I think we need to think that there may be at times where we're creating groundwater plumes that themselves are hazardous. And in particular, in the stormwater management plan, I would question the bullet point that says the city treatment facilities removal rates are best on based on testing conducted by the city along with modeling of similar type facilities I think that's a little questionable I think that there really needs to be a commitment to actually measuring downslope from these facilities to make sure they're doing what people think they're doing and I also want to emphasize it's not just phosphorus and ecology has been slow <laughs> so far but obviously water standards are increasing, knowledge of harms from various constituents are increasing, uh, and um, I'll email out a study by a researcher named Nat Schultz at the University of Washington who is looking at uh, stormwater runoff from um, impervious surfaces and their impact on coho salmon uh, gives them huge heart defects and they die. Uh, and he doesn't actually know yet what's causing that. But it is something that is in impervious surfaces. It is the kind of thing that we also ought to be concerned about. And so we need to be aware that it's not just phosphorus. And thank you very much. Thank you, Gaithia. And Kate Blystone. Anyone else who'd like to speak, please do come down at this time. I promise you I'll be brief. I wasn't going to speak tonight unless, oh, Kate Blystone, Resources for Sustainable Communities. I wasn't going to speak tonight unless the spirit moved me, and the spirit moved me, so here I am. Um, Resources is a local nonprofit that works to build sustainable communities through science, education, advocacy, and action. Thank you for this resolution tonight, and thank you for showing leadership on this issue. At Resources, we are passionate about ensuring clean and plentiful water in Whatcom County, and we're very supportive of any movement towards protecting Lake Whatcom. In 1999, when I moved here, Lake Whatcom was all that we talked about. I was a freshman at Western Washington University, going to Huxley College, taking all these great environmental courses, and it's all we talked about. Every class, we did a project on Lake Whatcom. And it feels like over the last, and there were nonprofits, there were articles, there was all sorts of things going on. And it feels like over the last couple of years that some of that momentum has been lost. And I'm, I'm grateful that it feels like we've gotten our mojo back, and I appreciate that. Um, Council Member Weimer is right. Uh, this resolution is going to lead to hard decisions, and please remember your vote tonight when you're making those hard decisions. Remember the commitment you made to Lake Whatcom tonight. We have to be aggressive and accelerate our timeline. We need to outpace the requirements of ecology, and we need to work together to exceed the pace even set in this resolution. Our drinking water is just too important, so thank you. Thank you, Kate. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? to the councils. Okay, then I am going to close the public comment period at this time, and um, I guess there's not really anything more that I can add to the eloquence that has happened here so far this evening. I will just say the Lake Whatcom uh, policy group does meet monthly. The schedule has been shifting a little bit lately, so I'd encourage you to look online or contact any of our offices to find out the schedule. Um, that is where a lot of the real interesting work happens that leads to reports at meetings like this. Uh, and it happens first before it comes to council bodies. So if you're interested as a member of the public in getting involved and learning more, everyone is welcome to attend those meetings. And with that, if there's nothing else, we are adjourned. Thank you. Oh. <laughs>